tried to warn them. They didn't listen. Yeah! Every week, the Hoffman Show goes into the belly of the beast. We read those comments, baby! Never read the comments. All right, Anthony, you ready to do this? We're a radio show. Typically, a yes or no verbally helps. Oh, yeah, my bad. Uh, yes, I am ready. I'm glad that you do enjoy this beat, though. Uh, Anthony, getting down uh, for the radio audience that can't see him. Uh, this is why you watch on YouTube. And uh, first of all, a shout out to everyone who watched uh, Never Read the Comments back on YouTube on demand last week and left us the cheers beers emoji. Many of you got through the video and, and left that uh, kind of Easter egg style comment. So that was that was fun, Anthony, to see kind of those appear throughout the week as people checked out the segment. But what we do is we take the best of uh, this radio show. Uh, we put it on on YouTube at Craig Hoffman and at the team 980. Uh, we take those the comments that you leave on those on demand videos and then we read and respond to them here on the Hoffman show. And then, of course, we re take this and post it for people to watch on demand and we repeat the process next week so uh without further ado let's dive into the comments and there was a lot of feedback as there usually is on overreaction tuesday with linnell and uh someone said weird someone once told me he meaning sam howell was holding the commander's offense back just a few weeks later we're asking if he's top 10 of course a couple weeks ago uh, the headline that I actually didn't like from Linnell, but it was it's called Overreaction Tuesday, so, you know, get with the segment, uh, is that Sam Howell was holding the offense back. And the fact was true, it was just a misleading headline because, you know, Sam Howell at that point, the snapshot in time, I thought was holding the offense back. I agreed with his premise. It's just like, hey, let's put it in the context of his development. He's got some growing to do to help this offense out. And here we are a couple weeks later and against Seattle on Sunday, he was the only reason they were really that productive. Um, he, he really was a one-man show for a lot of that game, creating the only big explosive plays that they had. And so, you know, someone once told me he was holding back. Now, a few weeks later, we're doing this. And it's like, yeah, they played more games. Everything that happens uh, in terms of the analysis is a snapshot in time. Where are we right now? Unless we're projecting forward. But even then, we're projecting forward based off what we know right now and i said some version of that uh to which ng gamer uh, nb6bu same person says that was a cop-out response three more games where sam showed the same potential he showed all year minus the buffalo game every single game he has played we have seen his future potential we have seen his accuracy we've seen what he can do with a clean pocket we have seen his playmaking ability we all know most of his issues were related to his o-line of course he was bound to progress as the season went on and became more comfortable what mattered most was he showed that early on with the lack of o-line he had around him at no point this season was he quote unquote holding us back the entire fan base saw it all the national media talked about it. I get you guys need controversial headlines to get people to click on your videos, but don't sit there and act like Linnell wasn't completely wrong with his assessment as he so clearly was. You yourself said it was a bad headline and it was clickbaity and referenced how Sam has elevated this offense. One, this is becoming my least favorite type of comment, Anthony. I cannot stand when people in some kind of argument against me say exactly as you said, yeah, I said it. Anthony? Your name is Anthony Haney! Yes, I know that, Chris. No, your name is Anthony! Haney! The third. The third. Like, what are we... What are you doing? Also, the idea... I'm going to say this once and for all. That's not once and for all. I'm going to have to say it every week until the end of time. The idea that the offensive line has changed, the play has changed dramatically, is wrong. Pretend my face just turned into that SpongeBob meme that's like, wrong, with a thousand O's that exit his mouth. The pressure rates are almost the exact same. Yes, as when Nick Gates was there. Yes, as when Sadiq Charles was there. They're almost the exact same. The difference is Sam has grown and is now able to avoid sacks at a significantly higher rate than he did earlier in the season. Hence, earlier in the season, his inability to avoid sacks was holding the offense back 
at that point in time while he also showed a lot of future potential. Now, that potential is able to shine into production, which is why he has three straight 300-yard games because he's not taking the bleeping sacks. I don't know why we have to explain this to so many people over and over and over again. But them's the facts, man. We don't watch the tape for funsies. We do it because it's our job and we actually know what we're talking about. The end on that one. You know what we're probably going to do next week during this segment? Talk about Sam Howe. Yep. And the, the same, same stupid comments. Yep. Pretty just, much. You can just not. You can just not leave that one. That would be cool. All right. Continuing on never read the comments. Uh, let's see. Um, this was in response to uh, our guy Lap called in yesterday. And um, we talked a little bit about the commanders and the state of it. And uh, I really like this comment from Jerry Dixon, 8135. Jerry says, the comment about Rivera not caring isn't true. However, I can understand how many fans could feel that way. He rarely shows emotion after tough losses and always appears to stand there with no expression on the sideline. Uh, that probably doesn't mean anything, and perhaps he is going crazy on the inside. For me, the worst was when Rivera at halftime of the Bears game told the sideline reporter that he would not address the team at halftime, but rather let the players talk amongst themselves. Regardless of what he would do at halftime, it probably should have just kept, or he probably should have just kept his mouth shut. Also, and this is the part that I think is most important, if Rivera had a better track record, then he could probably uh, likely get away with a lot more. Working on 10 non-winning seasons out of 13 is beyond embarrassing. Hopefully things change dramatically this offseason. Um, I think, I do think that uh, that part is safe. I do think there will be dramatic changes this offseason. But I, I think it's important to point out, like, it's not like Ron doesn't care. Um, although at times it's like, hey man, shouldn't caring look more like you care uh, on the sidelines and, and the passion? But like you, I've been in the room with Rivera after a game, after these these losses in the post game. He's steamed up inside and he does care. Um, the problem is, I think the last part, this will be 13 seasons as a head coach in the NFL. 10 of them are under 500. It is somewhat remarkable he has had the job as long as he's had. Uh, both jobs, Carolina and here, as long as he has. The the reputation of Rivera as like a competent, maybe even good NFL head coach is just not anything that matches with the record. And it's not that he doesn't care. It's that he's not good at the job. And that's when you have a track record this big, the record speaks for itself. And I don't mean to take like, that's not a personal shot at Ron. It's saying nothing about his character, his value as a human, anything. It's just saying at the job, the record suggests not that good at it and hasn't been for the majority of the time that he's been an NFL head coach. Uh, at DJ ir 9 fl says, you can't be anything with a losing record. The hype is disgusting and just to get fans to spend money. Washington never had a chance this season, but for some reason, the reporters and podcasts play like they are making a run or have a chance to make some noise. Like, are you kidding me? Then Washington trades their best defensive players. Uh, then they say they could make a run. Like, are you kidding me? Anthony, do you know where the Washington Commanders were in the NFC standings entering the Seattle game? Uh, we were eighth. Were they eighth? I thought they were seventh. Nah, we were eighth behind the Vikings. You sure that's not after this weekend? Because we're ninth right now. Yeah, but there's multiple teams that can move up on a given weekend. I'm pretty sure they were in seventh going into the weekend. Regardless, uh, let's say let's say even you're right. Let's yeah. say they were eighth, right? That's one game out of the playoffs. Yep. Or one spot out of the playoffs. So yeah, if they had gone to Seattle, they're in position and they've got the Giants coming up. They could have had a nice cushion going into the end of this incredibly difficult stretch of Dallas, Miami coming up. But they didn't. They lost. So it's not a hype thing. And it's a hey, they do have a chance. And, and it's kind of a, hey, if you want to be serious and you want to make the playoffs, this is your chance. And they blew it. So, you know, sorry sorry that you're mad at math. I also often get very mad at math. So, you know, Anthony, I have a lot of empathy for uh, this commenter on that one. Math and I, mm, not friends. Not friends. Not friends. Uh, continuing on, never read the comments. Uh, this one from... Wild Bill 0072. Oh, Wild Bill. 
Uh, four years of the defense giving up the same big plays. Same four years of the DBs making the same mistakes. Same four years of the defense missing tackles, making the same dumb penalties, and having the refs make horrendous calls. All but the last are laid at the feet of Jack Del Rio and his coaching staff. Either the coaches are not teaching, not correcting, or not leading the defensive players in a manner where they haven't even gotten better. Why? I don't know, but apparently neither do, ne- do they. And I think like what's crazy about this year is is and sam 48 wrote about this in the post today like they've always been able to figure it out every single year like they did finish top 10 defensively in multiple of the last four years it doesn't feel that way because they always start horrendously but they turn it around so dramatically that by the end the numbers actually look decent by the end and and if you want to take like the back half of the season they've been a top five unit in some of those stretches this year it's not happening um, and the fact that they, I, I think it, that's not like to excuse Del Rio because it's a lot of the same players. And I think that's, what's so incredibly frustrating is with so many of the same players. And this year they've got more continuity than they ever had before. Um, like the safeties were the same, the linebackers are the same, uh, or sorry, Jamin's in the same spot, the D line, you had the guys that have been here forever and a lot of the same depth pieces and they couldn't. They couldn't figure out how to play. And it's like, what are you doing from a teaching standpoint that you can't get the execution to be where you need it to be? Or are you that bad schematically? And and I think the other point that I like here is like, it's Del Rio and the staff, which he hired. So uh, yeah, we're headed towards, we're headed towards change this off season, which brings us to our next set of comments, starting with this one that I like a lot from Glenn Smith, uh, 491, who's a frequent commenter and watcher. Glenn, appreciate it. Thank you. I do not understand why people want to fire Ron now. Ron should be gone after the season, but the only reason you fire a coach in season is when your coach is toxic to the current players. Have not heard anything on that front. I think that is true, and I think that Ron still, I don't know, like he has the locker room wrapped around his finger, but you certainly haven't heard anything bad, um, which gets us to these comments. Um, Road, uh, R-O-D-E-D-A-T-X-2 says... What is Josh Harris waiting for? It's his team. Ron isn't the coach for next season. They aren't making the playoffs. Ron isn't even trying to do anything differently. The defense is 31st in the NFL. Why haven't there been any firings? Come on, finally put an end to the Dan Snyder era. Uh, and I get that feeling wise. Like, why have fire someone? We need a head on a platter. I get that emotionally, but I actually don't think it accomplishes anything, um, which is highlighted. Uh, I responded to that. And then uh, same commenter said, I just think. Uh, some use can be made out of the remaining season, staff evaluation-wise. Make off-season decisions e- easier by elevating some folks today and seeing what you have or don't in the building. What's to lose? Love your show, by the way. First of all, thank you. So kind. Um, second, to the point. Um, I've said this before, but I'll, I'll reemphasize it here. Elevating someone mid-season is different than giving them the job. It actually gives you a false uh, impression of what they are in a role. Because so much of coaching, so much of what you do in the NFL is about how you build something in the offseason. For instance, how you install your offense in the offseason to be a certain way in the season. So part of the commander's issue, in my opinion right now, is they don't run the ball enough or effectively. And they would run it more if they ran it more effectively. But they spent basically zero time on the field in the spring installing the run game. And then in, in training camp, they spent minimal time installing the run game. And so their excuse for not wanting to run it more is like, ah, well, we, we don't really do that uh, very much. And it's like, well, whose decision was that? And that's reflective of Eric Bieniemy as an offensive coordinator and the way he thinks about the game, or at least he thought about this season. Maybe if he has another season next year, he'll do it differently. Um, but that tells me something. And elevating... You know, how he would organize the offseason and practices and schematics and who he would hire by elevating him to head coach. Now, you don't find out any of that stuff. Would you get some difference? Yes. Would you get a slightly better view? Yes. But it is a terribly incomplete picture when you have someone doing the job on an interim basis. So that's that's that. And in terms of what's to lose, you have the, the loss of focus on the job at hand. Which the most, like, the biggest firing would be Rivera. You'd elevate EB to head coach. 
EB is not going to be able to fix your defense, I would think. Um, and EB needs to be able to spend his time as OC because he's already struggling to do everything he can at that. Maybe struggling is even too strong if you want to be kind to him. He is he is trying to figure out how to optimize his time as offensive coordinator, and he's in the middle of a growth process with a young quarterback. I'd let, rather let him focus on that. And the deterioration you would see uh, in his job doing that, I think, would, would be real if you made him the head coach. Um, which is a good reminder, by the way, from blah de blah triple oh seven it's a very odd uh, james bond offshoot uh, i'll take the fork where the qb seems like he's pretty good and is growing but the d struggles over the opposite i agree with that um definitely it's a good reminder to be like well if you're gonna have the season go down the tubes one way this is actually a pretty good way for it to go down um and then this last one last serious comment and then uh anthony i know you're gonna be very excited by this we got a funny comment we got the return of our guy Merle. <laughs> uh, but first, this one from Michael Milford, 8549. I feel like everyone keeps saying, I want to see more because of how this franchise has been burned so many times. Everyone else already wants to call CJ Stroud MVP. The difference is people make a lot out of a draft pick. And here's what I would say. I would, I would counter your argument with a question, Michael. Why was CJ Stroud a number two overall pick? Because people thought, based off of what he was, he was really good. He's doing the things that we thought he would do. So there's no reason to question it. Sam Howell was a fifth-round pick because there were real questions about could his ability to do it at this level, from avoiding pressure and not taking sacks to can he succeed and see the field properly at his height? Uh, could he produce without elite offensive weapons around him like he had in his second year at Carolina as opposed to the offense he was forced to run? in his third and I know a lot of people uh say like look he was still good his third year it just was different kind a different kind of good and that includes by the way his head coach and Mac Brown so like I I don't have a lot of questions about Sam of course I want to see more because why wouldn't I like if you're gonna make the decision you want as much data as possible especially when you're not actually delaying anything nobody that is gonna make the long-term decision on Sam Howell is actually in place right now because this whole coaching staff is probably getting blown out and even if, you know, EB stays, like, okay, fine, then I guess EB can make that call, but he wouldn't make it as the head coach or as a retained offensive coordinator until January anyway. So, it, it you know, these things can happen at once. CJ Stroud's having a remarkable year, and based off the year he's having, he should be in the MVP conversation, uh, which is crazy, but it's true. Like, he's his statistics are outrageous. The Texans are way better than people thought, and currently they're in the playoffs. He deserves to be in the conversation. Sam is also playing better than a lot of people expected, but it's a it's a growth trajectory. And by the way, he is not playing to the level CJ Stroud is, and it's actually not close. Is he playing way better than basically every other young quarterback? Yeah, probably. But I also think that like you take a look under the hood at some of the advanced numbers, and it's like if your if your whole thing with Sam Howell is he's leading the NFL in passing, your argument's actually pretty hollow. Um, again, I like Sam. I think he's going to be the guy. I've seen a lot that I really, really like. But to pretend like there isn't room for growth is crazy So like, and, and inaccurate. So let's continue to watch him grow and just enjoy that process. All right, which brings us, last but not least, to Merle. Merle Garrett, 9120, a uh, frequent commenter and a fantastic sport, said, uh, let Ron finish the season and transfer power to EB. For those who thinks it won't be EB, use critical thinking skills. Do you think he would come here if he wasn't promised to be the next head coach with a staff that was on the hot seat? I asked Merle, uh, do you, like, promised by who? And Merle's response was that if I didn't think that Josh Harris was... Uh, talking to people around Ashburn before he officially took the ownership uh, on July 20th, then I was crazy. Anthony, do you remember when Eric Bieniemy was hired? Uh, late February, early March? Yeah, it was, it it was, was like after weeks, the Super Bowl last like year. Like two weeks after the Super Bowl or one week or something like that? Yeah, it was uh, it was, it was was February of last year. Yeah. Um, do you know, do, do you remember? Actually, it might have been even been later than that. It was like really late. Um, 
or maybe it was his, like they hadn't hired an O-line coach or something like that. But like it was February of last year, I'm yeah. pretty sure. Right? When did Josh Harris win the bidding for the team? The July. No, no, no. Not oh, not oh, not May. not finalize the sale. Oh, May. I think he won the bidding in like March. Like we oh, knew March. he okay. was the guy in March or April. And then he like officially like was gonna get it by like May. Yeah. So in February, before he had won the bidding, Merle <laughs> says he got a promise. Or gave a promise to E B. Wow. Crazy. Crazy. Merle. All right, you like Merle can leave your comments at Craig Hoffman on any of our YouTube videos and we pick out some of the best or worst and we comment on them here on the Team 980. What's up, kiddos? It's your boy Clinton Yates from ESPN. It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980. Tell your mama I said what's up.